happy to have you all back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Human Architecture. This happening to be our 338th episode. And you are watching us as the um, uh, 19,101st viewer. We appreciate that very much. And us is the two bald and the one with hair on. Uh, two of you in Honolulu, Jay Fidel, our producer, and uh, Martin Ancelini, uh, who is from Colombia, the country I've joined us in Hawaii about a year ago, and me, Martin Despang, having moved back from the former East, well, still in the East, but it's not the Eastern part of Germany anymore, which got you excited, Jay, because that's where Cleo and Netflix series is talking about the GDR and the Stasi background there. And last time we were sort of saying, well, we got the wall down and we got that dictatorship down. But there's also, unfortunately, the East is where the AFD, which is the alternative for Germany, it is not an alternative. It's a right wing party. And that unfortunately thrives there very well. And that is very, very Sad. Uh, I'm back in the south of Germany, which you all consider to be where you would go if you would visit us. You're in the Alps, you're at the Oktoberfest, you're with the Dirndls and the Lederhosens, and you're around Neuschwanstein, which gets us back to architecture, because that has been built at the same time as our Iolani Palace. If you think about the two, uh, they were both high-tech, by the way. Both these kings were very, very keen on, you know, uh, the Kalakaua got Edison talked into giving him the light bulb before the White House in Washington, D.C. got it. That w They call him weird King Ludwig here, who built the Neuschwanstein Castle, had an electric sleigh, and he drove around with them, and that must have been driving people crazy, you know, and he had running water, uh, floor radiant heating things. So this was really, really innovative. As the building we're going back to, because we talked about it last time, was for the heydays of um, statehood. 1959, uh, Hawaii uh, got part of the United States. And uh, this is a, a building here from very early that, Jay, you only after the last show got us hyper excited about what a lovely story, literally and figuratively speaking, this building here embodies, or one of them, you can tell us. And so this is from Midtown Flunk, because unfortunately, uh, recently, this area has been surrounded by uh, something that we just talked, maybe worse than Kaka'ako, because it, it's all these blue box towers that seem to be like, uh, I know you're interested in artificial intelligence in an intelligent way, Jay. This is this is an unintelligent way of all these high rises, all these blue boxy things popping up. So they almost suffocate this pretty genius building from the past that we talked about in the last show. But maybe even more important, you, thanks Jay, uh, reminded us of the inside out, which I should have not forgotten because I always tell the students as the first thing, uh, don't do an outside in, do an inside out approach. So what lovely story can you eyewitness tell us from the plinth, the base of this building where the Bank of Hawaii used to be in and still is? And this brings well, us back to 1965. Uh, there are three points on my compass for that period of time, Martin. One was a Coast Guard building. It was called the Seaboard Building. And I guess that's an insurance company or something. And uh, it was like three or four stories high. And and the uh, ocean side of the building overlooked the water. So you could see the ocean. You can't do that today from the Seaboard Building. That's where the Coast Guard headquarters were. And at the very top floor, uh, they conducted search and rescue operations because they could see what was happening off the, off the south coast of Oahu. Um, you can't do that now. Anyway, that was one point. That's where I worked. And a block away was the uh, was the Ala Moana building, which was a very legitimate, you know, business office building in those days. And and the uh, Bank of Hawaii had a fair amount of space in there. It was, um, you know, their their prime property, as a matter of fact, at that time. And so um, that's where I met my wife. She was a teller there. And if I didn't tell you the story before, I walked in with my first paycheck, it was uh, just over $100. And uh, I wrote on the back of the deposit slip, uh, will you have dinner with me? 
And she um, looked at me and said, I do not have dinner with Howley boys. I did tell you the story. I do not have dinner with Howley boys, but I can have lunch with you. And so there, there we went. And that's, that was how many years ago, almost 55 years ago. Um, so now the third point was Alamoana itself. Alamoana Shopping Center was one story and there were very few shops in there. And uh, they were um, trying to you know, preserve their property rights so that if you parked in Alamoana Shopping Center, they would put a, a, a sticker on your front windshield that you couldn't get off. It was very hard to get it off. And it said, you're not supposed to park here. That was so offensive, not kidding. Um, but anyway, all it was was one story high. And you know, the last I knew, um, the thing was worth uh, oh, billions, the shopping center. And look at what they've done. It's, it's really, I mean, you could spend a show, Martin, talking about the evolution of Alamoana Shopping Center um, as a, an architectural phenomenon. It is bloody awful in terms of public spaces, in terms of humane architecture. But that was what was there at the time. And those were the three points of the compass for me when I arrived in 1965. Yeah. And there is actually a show somewhere. We got to dig it out. Not just about the Alamoana building. That's called the coolest commercial classic, as we show quote down there. But there is also a show about, and I think the Soto did a couple of other ones. So 1965, Jay, just before that lovely, literally and figuratively speaking, moment in that building that reminds us of the human and the humane of architecture, that people's life, you know, you know, happen um, in the most lovely way in buildings. And that same year, some month before that, uh, you were where we will go back now to Barcelona. And just to remind us, that was about a decade before that became democratic because Franco was still running that. So you were kind of sneaking into it, making a comparison to the former East here, you know, in, in Germany. And this building here um, is, has been, is in many ways uh, not unsimilar to what we remember the Alamana building when it still had the louvers. They were able to shade the building pretty sufficiently. And that one, you must have inspired Martin because it was built soon after you were there the last time, which is now one and a half decades ago. In, in 08, you were there. And this was built in uh, 2010, so two years later. And it's by this firm, I'm probably butchering, but you're the uh, Spanish speaker, Martin Betle Roig Architecture. So they built yeah. this building. And once again, this is, this is the entrance of the building. We got louvers on the outside. Uh, we are then in the shade there. Um, and we see a, a facade there on the right side, leaning over, tilting. And that reminds us, that gets us back to what, Jay? To up on the Alamoana building, La Ronde. Right, La Ronde had and still has the glass tilted. We see amongst you know you and your wife. You took your wife probably then up there too at some point. No, I had no I money. I had no money. Oh, I'm sorry. No money. I, well, yeah. okay. I'm it was sorry a very romantic so. place, but you had to have money. Okay, so Elvis, as we see here, was better off. You know, obviously, you know, at that point. This year, luckily, we have Arc Daily and other uh, architectural uh, publishers who we uh, were sneaking uh, these images from, as you rightly so reminded us. Don't judge a book by the cover. Don't look at architecture from the outside. Go inside, because that's where people spend most of the time. Thanks for the homework, Jay. We did it here. And here is a picture that you can see that the building um, it looks pretty comfortable. I mean, there's artificial lighting, there's computers there, but there's a lot of glass, there's a lot of light, and there's uh, the absence of sun. So this is just like the Alamoana building, not heating up the building. Another similarity, really good buildings, especially high rises, by the way. When I went to you know school in, in, the, in the heartland, in Nebraska, in the early 90s, we were taught by the way, the high rise was always a terminal project. Students had to do a high rise, a skyscraper as their final project. That tells you something. And of course, we were taught in 101, the building has to have a base, the building has to have a shaft, and the building has to have a crown. 
So um, often in, in buildings, especially of capital concentration, it gets more exclusive the more you get to the top. And while this might be true in some way for the La Ronde, because it was an expensive restaurant, but at least it was a restaurant, Jay, right? So it was public, but you, it was sort of uh, exclusively public, we can say. This building here also has a nice, um, you know, it, it tapers back not just to the bottom, but also to the top. So there's a roof. We can call this a lanai, right? Because this is deep enough. This is not what you rightly called out, Jay, last time, these shallow, flimsy balconies they are just decoration. This is really doing a job in, in, in shading you sufficiently and also being able to have a public space there, a semi-public space. You can lounge there, hopefully not smoke a cigarette because that's not healthy, but you can hang out there and, and look over the city. So this, there's some plants there too, right? So that looks pretty, pretty, pretty nice, pretty comfortable. And uh, this one here um, is also a plus point for the building because um, we, you just said, Jay, uh, Hawaii is ignorant of old buildings. That is very true. Barcelona, in this case, as an example, is not because there is actually an old building there that they built the building next to or on top of it. And at the bottom left is two show quotes of a big missed opportunity on Capulani Boulevard, which was our mid-century, um, you know, magnificent mile. And uh, they basically, you know, put all these blue artificial intelligence boxes there and they butchered the Kenrock building amongst others. And we were saying before that happened, why don't you put the two high rises in the courtyards of the Kenrock building and basically integrate at least, you know, the buildings into. So the legacy of the building survives and gives the building an identity, a quality, uh, but, you know, as they don't care, right? They just bulldoze everything, they raise everything and build their new stuff. And, and then they miss the opportunity of having such a beautiful basement in this case. Exactly. Absolutely. So we're on to something that we said last time. How about we go back to the early 60s and mandate shade that buildings have to shade themselves. As you know, people have to shade themselves when they go out in the sun. They get a sunburn, they get cancer eventually, they get a heat stroke. So everyone protects themselves as a human being. So why don't we make buildings, which are basically then the third envelope, if we call clothing our second one. Here's an example of another example of a building that does that. And this is the point. These buildings might not look um, very um, pop culturally attractive. They kind of look abstract, right? They don't. They don't get uh, the the kind of the romantic general public excited about themselves. It it takes a certain level of education to actually appreciate to see what is actually happening and what is what is going on in these buildings here. And only if you do that, and then if you look some detailing, <laughs> you can see here, this is extruded aluminum. And when, the, when a truck or something bangs into it, it rips it apart. But here we go. Thanks to your homework, Jay. There's a picture here from Arc Daily again. That looks pretty damn nice, right? If you think you're working in this building, you got a view, wow, it doesn't look as austere as it looks from the outside. And you can actually see here that we criticized, Martin, you did because you were there when it was under development, that W Hotel by Beau Phil to the right. This is facing the ocean. The ocean is the other way around. This is, this is east, so you got the morning sun there versus we got the west sun. This is why it's, it's very, very close to that side and you only got these small open slits that give you a clear view, but the rest of the panels are perforated. So, you know, while it looks um, opaque from the outside, it's actually transparent from the inside out. So thanks, Jay, again, for reminding us of our 101 in architecture. Well, I suggested last time that you have to look inside, but, but there's one more thing. There's one more thing. So this may be good inside, but look how sterile that is compared to the... Uh, the photo you showed just a few minutes ago, 
with a lanai that had koa furniture and plants and had it's some kind of interior design. This is, this, is, this is not welcoming and warm what you're showing us. This needs the koa furniture, it needs the plants, it needs something because um, without that, it's, it's just um, unfriendly. Yeah, and I think you hit a point why we architects basically shoot ourselves in our knees because we, Martin, you know that very well. There is a sort of um, obsession at getting the photographer uh, to do the photo shooting, the money shots, the party shots when the building is finished and, and the users haven't screwed it up yet. That's kind of the thinking behind it, right? Because architects have a very particular thinking about And they forget what you just said, that the general public thinks of buildings being lovely if they're inhabited and people leave, you know, there are things there and, and, and bring in plans and bring in things. So that's another lesson to learn for us architects. Absolutely. And these are not um, exceptions to the rule that we're showing you. This is actually the rule that each building, almost an unwritten code, we see another building here in the distance, if we get closer, you see there's something fuzzy about the building. And uh, the closer you get, uh, it, the weirder it looks. What this is actually something that we remember from a project of Despeng Architect, and this is metal mesh that we talked about, Dominic Perot, he was actually inventing that with a German um, a metal company, GKD, uh, they did this for the Très Grand Bibliothèque, the big uh, Mitterrand kind of donated or, in, or in, in, um, sponsored library there in France. So this is a double facade that you explained to us, Martin, but this is a double facade of a different kind. And this is a picture I took from this project of ours, which is a train station. This has a double mesh. Um, And so we don't get the view here, but um, we see there's light coming through. So if you imagine you only have one layer, I could not find an interior picture of that uh, building there. So you guys uh, got to look for it uh, yourself. But this is, this is clearly demonstrating you this metal mesh uh, that the building has um, is leaving it uh, again, very, very transparent from the inside out and, and enough shaded from the outside in. So does this all sound very luxurious, right? The developers always talk about, oh, we can't afford that. Even Howard Hughes, when I was, you know, guiding GJ, we said, we remember when we had the German Chamber of Commerce coming through and we gave them a tour and we're part of their, you know, convention. And, and Howard Hughes, the first, you know, what do you call it? The president or whatever, that, that former uh, football star, basically then then said oh oh we couldn't afford sustainability you know mm -hmm. we're like give us a break you're not social housing low income here we're talking big bucks you're a high end right so you really want to tell us so does this here you know looks and this is this is a hotel and it's interesting that you see what's on the as a decoration behind the bed is actually the silhouette and they're celebrating towers The few towers they have, right, they don't have nearly as many as we have. You can count them probably on a couple of hands. But the ones they have, of course, Sagrada Familia, uh, Tora Akbar, we talked about last time, right? The, the ones of SOM and the other ones on the right side. So they really celebrate them even for tourists in a hotel room. And they got these uh, expanded stretched metal uh, shutters on the other side. And you might say, hey, that is, you know... You see there's a view, you see there is still some sunlight in there, but not too much. And you might say, oh, that's really quite something. So is, you might say, okay, this is again, probably, you know, uh, unaffordable. No, it's not. You go to Easy Hotel, what that is called, and 87 bucks, try to get a hotel room at all in, in Hawaii for 87 bucks. Good luck, right? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. So this tells you, it is not too expensive to do things like that. And on Actually, the right it is side, cheaper because they are spending so much energy in the future. Probably, I mean, it's short-term and lazy and cheap. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So again, the building on the right, top show quote from uh, Gones and Grills back then, this <laughs> is the King building by Takashi. And same thing, even color-wise, has that golden screen 
uh, that um, you know works well, has been working well. Building from the 60s once again, people in Barcelona do this in 2016. So it couldn't be more apparent for us that it's time to uh, revisit our past and to evolve it uh, in Honolulu. Even when you take that express bus from the airport, you drive by these buildings here that you see screens after screens after screens that work really well. Another thing I think, Jay, you just said it, you know, we don't respect old buildings. Uh, this is a building from, 19, from the 50s, same time that the Alamana building was built uh, a few years later. And Carlos Ferrater, uh, you pronounce him correctly, Martin, we yeah. very well know as one of the leaders in, in, in Spanish architecture, has taken this on uh, and to uh, remodel it. Uh, this is again not um, this is not cheap. This is the Mandarin Oriental that we by the way talking about Capulani Boulevard This has been a construction site for very long at the intersection of uh, Capulani Boulevard. And what's the other street that's going towards the ocean Jay? Um, forget where the entrance of the Alamana Hotel is on anyways, and this corner is oh, supposed to be Atkinson Atkinson. Thank you very much. Exactly. But this again this talks about you, you have to try to keep old buildings in, in, in alive. Uh, you have to recognize the gray energy and, and revitalize them. Or if you build new buildings, you got to do the best uh, that you can do of these days, which all the projects we've been showing you before. This is a building that always puzzled me uh, the two times I've been there in 21 and now in 24 when we sent me there. Because this is how I always think that's how we could live in Honolulu, you know, I mean, from a climatic point of view, you're in the shade in there, you're out of the rain, so you would actually not get a frostbite, uh, because we don't get never gets that cold and it, you're in the shade there. This is I looked this up here. This is a, a former um, um, factory. Um, and it's actually by um, by Siemens that German company here and uh, that has a long tradition of ever since Peter Behrens at the very bottom left here. Um, and uh, this building has been uh, like that now for four years. So you're kind of wondering, I'm still trying to find um, uh, information about it, but it reminds me of when we had Thomas Auer there and we drove by the supposedly new recent affordable Howard Hughes Tower at the top right show quote there. And, um, and I said to Thomas, um, climatically, you could move in. So it just reminds us, um, you know, leaving buildings, making buildings, we will show you Googled, you know, architecture in Barcelona, Jay, and the second that popped up was the Barcelona Pavilion by, by the Germans, by Mies van der Rohe. And Mies said, amongst many other things, less is more. So we should really think about keep buildings. Build simple is the new thing by Thomas Auer and by Florian Nakla. We should really dwell on that in Honolulu because climatically we have the most privileged conditions to do that. And um, another thing here is we talked about Ricardo Bofill, who passed away in between when I was there in two years ago in 2022. And while he might have been gotten a little off track in his later years, as we discussed last time, Martin, right? His early work where he made this cement factory, um, his own home and studio, this is, this is an absolute classic of of revitalization of gray energy making it green this is a building that is so amazing and it's from the it's from the 70s so are the the projects the walden projects that he did down there yeah, they, so and they were about, doing they were, were doing great with parties i was told by former teachers that this studio this space that was their beginning was a space for meetings and they were talking about architecture they were dancing they were having a uh, nice time there yeah and and yeah absolutely and so this is a building here that i ran into by accident i have to say and i got totally excited about it because jay 
eight years ago, this show with Scott Wilson, where you guys were talking about bringing more green into the cities. You see it now in, in, in all the publications. You see, you know, the heat island effect and the cities get too hot and are becoming detrimental for people. You got to cool the cities and greening the cities is a big thing. Has it happened in Hawaii yet? No, it hasn't happened. Uh, it has happened in our minds, Martin and the two Martins here, Martins, but not anywhere else. It's another uh, element to that, Martin. It's yeah. really pretty. It's really pretty. Yeah. It's a joy to look at. It's it's eye candy, um, and it's um, geez, so aesthetic, so different than the hardcore concrete forms. I love this building. Thank you for showing this building. Yeah. And this is this is and this is a show here with uh, the Soto. It is out of concrete, yes, but it is not brutal uh, because it is softened by the green. And so, also on a physical sense, here the Soto was simulating with a cigarette lighter and a piece of concrete that if the sun, as a heat source simulated by the cigarette lighter here, beats the concrete all the time, the concrete is getting hot and it's going to radiate back. Not in this case here. So um, this is a very, very good example. And it's achieved by a very clever trick that you see on the right. It's actually a double, it's a double facade. It's a double green facade because um, it has green on, on in two different depth, uh, depth layers. So you can say, well, maybe the green, you know, on one layer isn't quite making it, right? There is still the other layer. So it's very, very intelligent. And so this must be a very, very cool contemporary building. Well, the, the date of the building is down there, 74 and 75. This wow. building, you know. So give us a break, right? It's really about time to, to reconsider all the goodies. I want to thank uh, Bandit Kaniha Khan a lot because he gave me this book here. Now here I have it in real and here it is uh, scanned. And this he had, and it only goes to 2002, as we can see here. So not even when you were there, the newest stuff was, was in there yet. But this building here I found in there, and that's what I could do the homework. And I found it here on, on, on Pinterest here in this Barcelona apocalypse. What a weird kind of a combination of perceptions of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, in, indeed, again, a great celebration. So um, we're kind of running out of time here, but let's uh, do a little bit of appetizing here for when we wrap this up next time. Um, this is, we want to put out as food for thought, maybe what we can learn the most, maybe literally from Barcelona. This is a tower. Uh, maybe you want to explain which one that is, Martin, because um, you knew this from when you were there. It was actually already a couple of years old. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember that this that tower that was recently built at that time was even accepted by the most traditional Catalan uh, architects and the most critical people at the university because they did good. No, the, it is infrastructure as Aloha Tower, as a lighthouse, as uh, but they did it well. No, they 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 took their time on on thinking twice and doing things like bringing design to something that was uh, required as a as a as an infrastructure so this was very celebrated at that time and still is no it became somehow a part part of these landmarks of of the city yeah and it talks about you know the jean nouvel as we said as a frenchman you know was allowed to build in in barcelona and 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 so barcelona is a very international city but it allows people in to who really thrive for excellence. And that is yeah. something that we know, Jay, from back then. The architects in when you came in 65, all the architects, you know, might it have been Vladimir Osipov, um, Edwin Bauer, um, um, Alfred Price, who came from Austria, right? Um, Edwin Bauer was American. Osipov was born in Russia, educated in Japan. They were from all over the world, right? And many more. Takashi Anbi, obviously, was Asian. They came to Hawaii and said, oh, my God, I'm at the most beautiful place, if not on Earth, you know, for sure in America. I have to do better than I would already do 
in America, which was already doing pretty well. And then, unfortunately, Jay, as we said, we lost that. We're at this low point, which gets lower and lower and lower. So we have to go back to which show quote top left there. Once we had Neil Abercrombie, former governor, in an architectural studio in a crit, and he had Wither Honolulu by Lewis Mumford, which he did his PhD on. And he was lobbying for Renzo Piano that we were talking about before, as he could think as the one who would top and break this stupid 400 feet, you know, um, you know, capping. And, and having a beacon coming out, that is an intelligent beacon. That is not the Cone Peters and Fox stupid uh, bank in, in downtown from the 90s. That is a stupid beacon, but a beautiful, a fascinating, a substantially beautiful beacon. That's what he was lobbying for. And, 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 and others did that, did that as well you know, later. That, that's really what we wanted to... Thomas Owl was also recommending from all the star architects, you know, and certainly... Norman Foster, who was a, a buddy of, of, of Piano, they all started out as the high tech guys in the, in the 70s. Um, th these would be probably people, we don't want to forget our emerging generation, right? They should be predominantly together. So you should have the best of the best from somewhere else uh, in selected projects. But as the foundation, you should have the local firms because most of the project we were showing you uh, up to now, uh, we're actually local firms, right? So you don't want to basically, that's what the locals all often complain about, Jay, right? They say, oh, we never get any jobs here. But then you import these douchebags. Sorry, you know, Cortwell, Solomon Cortwell Bunes is not a firm that, uh, that appear in architectural magazines and get us all excited. Lord or Baron, he's now Foster, you know, really has proven all over the world to be a sensitive architect, uh, both aesthetically and environmentally. So yes, he did his dues and, and he's welcome to, to come and would do. So as sort of like the appetizer for wrapping this up next week, this tower is, and this is what we want to throw at you guys and make you think about, is actually less about gravity, but more about tensegrity, as Bucky Fuller called it. Bucky Fuller was the guy with the domes and we had a, a, um, a, a, a dome in Waikiki that was the Kaiser Dome by Henry J. Kaiser that was built after that Bucky Fuller kind of theme. And so here we see a tower just to explain to you that has uh, only one central piece, a spine in the middle or a spike. That is the only gravity thing. Everything else, including these floor slabs here, actually suspended from that one post. And that's why this thing looks so elegant. It looks not clumsy. It is not an eyesore, right? It is, it is very elegant because it's saying, hey, you know, I could do more with less. And probably with this, looking at the clock here, we have to leave you with that and leave it with that. But to pick it up from there to, again, uh, what all from Barcelona can we maybe take and, um, and reconnect to our own beautiful history and legacy in Honolulu, Hawaii. See you for that next week. Back. Bye-bye.